On behalf of Octavio Hinojosa Mir, uh, I would like to thank the Rumi Forum for their gracious invitation uh, to uh, invite uh, the two of us to come here and uh, have an opportunity to speak about the U.S. Hispanic community and uh, the opportunities and the challenges that are ahead. Uh, my name is Viviana uh, Hurtado. I am uh, a correspondent at ABC News. Uh, I came to Washington uh, four years ago as a correspondent for Al Jazeera English when the channel uh, launched. And I had an opportunity uh, after about a year or so to come to uh, uh, t to go to ABC. Uh, before my life here in Washington as a network correspondent at an international level and now here on a national level, uh, I uh, worked my way up uh, in local markets and that included Brownsville, Texas on the U.S.-Mexico uh, border. Uh, but before that I was an academic and the topic that we're talking about today um, in many ways um, has been uh, a passion of mine, some would say an obsession, mm -hmm. which is looking mm -hmm. at uh, Hispanic culture and U.S. national identity. Uh, it was the topic of my uh, senior essay at UC Berkeley, uh, my master's essay at Stanford, and ultimately my dissertation at Yale University. So um, some things you just can't put uh, to bed, I guess. Uh, but with no further ado, I'd like to interview. I'd like to interview or really introduce uh, a person who is doing so much for um, to <coughs> raise awareness, um, not just of the U.S. Hispanic community in the United States, but really um, allow everybody to understand that um, this is a vital part of uh, uh, U.S. culture and one that respects, honors, and reveres. Uh, the founding principles of our nation. Uh, Octavio and Jose Mir is also a very dear friend of mine, and so I'd like you, Octavio, if you mm -hmm. could just introduce yourself very briefly and tell us about the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. Sure. Well, thank you again, Vivian, for the introduction. Again, thank you, the Rumi Forum and, and your guests here for joining us today for this uh, topic discussion on the U.S. Hispanic community opportunities and challenges. Um, as Viviana uh, in, in mentioned, I am the executive director of the Congressional Hispanic Leadership Institute. It is a nonprofit 501c3 organization that was founded in 2003 by members of, of the United States Congress on both sides of the aisle, as well as a business executives who felt that there was an, a need uh, to have a national Hispanic nonprofit organization that would uh, promote leadership within this important demographic group of the United States, especially since in the year 2003 when it was made official by the United States government that the United States Hispanic community is now the second largest demographic group in, in the United States or largest minority group, however you prefer to uh, refer to it. Uh, the, the U.S. Hispanic community is a community that is obviously uh, it growing in its demographics, economic uh, power, but also politically. And our focus with the organization is promoting diversity of thought within the Hispanic community. Um, there are oftentimes uh, uh, people are tend to believe that the U.S. Hispanic community is monolithic, that we all believe the same things, have the same ideological points of view. Of course, it's far from that. Uh, the U.S. Hispanic community is a very diverse community. It's as diverse as the United States population is in general. And uh, what we do in this, uh, in our mission of promoting diversity of thought is to provide opportunities of open dialogue where we can discuss issues of, uh, of time of importance, whether it's public policy issues or foreign relations issues, and bring individuals from different points of view to, to the table and have a you know, productive, uh, constructive conversation, obviously always done in a very respectful uh, manner. Uh, you know, we, our programs are focused on leadership development, specifically within the Hispanic community, but again, we are proud to say that our programs are open to individuals of all backgrounds, and uh, we have committed ourselves to promoting uh, diversity not only within the organization itself, just by looking at the composition of our board members and staff, but also in our programming. So we have, uh, we, we have programs that promote leadership in public service, we have programs that promote leadership in the private sector, and leadership in the international relations field. So uh, in the past six years at Chile, as we refer to the organization, uh, it has grown to become one of the most visible national Hispanic organizations, and perhaps at this point, the most visible at the international scale. So in a nutshell, that's what Chile does. And again, I welcome everyone to visit our website, learn more about the organization. 
So, Octavio, um, when we look at the U.S. Hispanic community mm -hmm. today, and I'm so happy that you qualify that by saying that we speak about the U.S. Hispanic community as mm -hmm. if it were one, but that's really a working term because of this diversity sure. within the group mm -hmm. um, that yeah. certainly is national, uh, educational, uh, economic. But uh, y you look at some bullet points, some facts. Y you were talking about uh, the uh, the, it's the second largest uh, demographic group in the United States with an incredible earning potential in the mm -hmm. billions. Uh, and with the last census as well, we saw that uh, the U.S. Hispanic population is at around 16 percent, but could very well surpass that, give or take mm -hmm. a couple of percentage points. Those are the pluses. And certainly, if you were to turn on uh, Univision or Telemundo, you see everybody, Ford, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Apple, everybody is advertising because they get the mm -hmm. importance of this fast-growing group as well as its purchasing power. But there's also some challenges. It doesn't seem that politically and culturally uh, this group at this point um, has been able to keep up with its demographic power mm -hmm. and its purchasing power. Can you talk about that? Sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, there are, there are key elements, as you, you mentioned, uh, Viviana, that as uh, as a society as Americans we need to all take into consideration when we uh, discuss anything related to the Hispanic community. Uh, speaking in demographic terms, uh, the two th we just recently concluded our decennial census, the 2010 census, and already the initial numbers are uh, pointing that the United States Hispanic population will reach the 50 million mark for the first time. That is compared to where it was 10 years ago, 30, 35 million approximately, in other words, in the last 10 years, it's estimated that the Hispanic population has grown 42%, whereas the rest of the general population has grown less than 5%. So you see this important demographic growth that is taking place before our eyes in the last, last 10 years, and, it, and I should also say in the last uh, 30 years uh, approximately. The, the U.S. Hispanic community uh, is also the youngest of all the, major, of all the demographic groups. Uh, it's the uh, medium age right now, we're at 27. We're basically 10 years younger than the general population. But if you look at specific states, the difference between the medium age of the Hispanic community of a particular state and that of the rest of the general population is sometimes staggering. Uh, for example, looking at the state of Kansas, uh, I was fortunate and always been say that I'm fortunate and blessed to have, uh, to have been raised in the state of Kansas. It is, you know, the state that's right, that's right in the middle of the country. At this point, the state of Kansas, uh, it's, uh, it's the median age of Kansas is at 49. And if I asked you, can you tell me what the median age of a Kansan-born Hispanic is? It's 14. So in other words, half of the Hispanic population in the state of Kansas, which is a state that I'm more familiar with, is under the age of 14, yet not even economically uh, productive. And uh, whereas the rest of the state is already at the 49, if not higher, in some parts of the, of the state. So we're looking at a at a, a demographic group that is about to enter a very productive period of its development or of, of its stage. Uh, just this past weekend there was an article that came out discuss, discussing this important uh, ish, uh, point on the demographics and the economic, uh, economic factors. Uh, in 2007, the U.S. Hispanic community surpassed the African American community as our nation's second largest economic group in terms of purchasing power. That is to say that the U.S. Hispanic community today, at this point in 2010, has a purchasing power of $1 trillion. If we look around the world, how many countries in the world have an economic or GDP that's at the trillion dollar level? You could count perhaps a 20, even less than 20 uh, national economies at that level. And with this census, we're looking at a 50 million uh, population. How many countries in the world have a population less than 50 million, the vast majority? You know, the, the, the size of the U.S. Hispanic community, if we look at, compared it to other countries, we're look, talking about a country the size of South Africa, the uh, uh, size of Ukraine, with the economic, you know, potential power of, a, of an Australia, of a Spain, in fact, even. So this is a, an important uh, economic demographic group within the United States itself. But also, when we look at, from the marketing perspective, over, over national companies or even foreign-based companies that want to enter the United States, they're taken into serious consideration the buying trends or purchasing, you know, preferences of, of the Hispanic community. And it's really interesting to point out that the U.S. Hispanic community, as it is right now, in terms of its medium age, in terms of its family structure, in terms of its um, values, 
is basically the same, uh, has the same stats or same pattern that the U.S. population had in the 1950s with the baby boom generation. So if we and remember... And if I can just mm -hmm. jump in here, um, and yet we all know, m many of us at mm -hmm. least, those of us who've been you know, working in this, uh, on this topic for many years, can just rattle off the bullets. Mm -hmm. Um, the happy bullets is what I call sure. them, but there's a real political lag, it mm -hmm. seems, between this potential of um, U.S. Latinos mm -hmm. and their political representation. Sure. And so, for example, when you see something like um, a hot topic, um, immigration, uh, how is it, I think, Octavio, if you could talk to us, y what explains to you uh, the uh, I guess, you know, give us the context of how Arizona came to pass uh, the controversial law uh, that is being challenged by the sure. federal government and that people are saying is going to be replicated, mm -hmm. um, you know, within weeks, if not months, sure. uh, in states and in communities throughout the mm -hmm. country. Okay, no, good, good question. I think it's, you know, when we, before we go dive into, I guess, the specifics of Arizona, since it is the hot topic here. At, in, in, a, in the national debate uh, on, on, a, on the <coughs> issue of immigration. It's important to, as Americans or even the world community, to appreciate that not only is the United States diverse in its demographics, it's also diverse in its geography and its history. And when we look at the southwest of the United States, um, it is a part of the region uh, where the largest ancestry group of Americans are of Mexican background. Uh, Arizona, of course, you know, being a state that borders Mexico, has the largest ancestry group of Arizonans today is of Arizo is, uh, are, are Mexican descent, approximately 25 percent of the of the population. The 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 growth of the Hispanic community throughout the United States varies from region to region. Of course, the Southwest has always had a historical presence of of, of Hispanic uh, civilization, if you will, as a result of that part of the country which was uh, explored, colonized, and settled by Spanish explorers beginning from the 1500s all leading all, all the way up to the mid uh, 1800s when that part of the region uh, came under uh, American jurisdiction as a result of the U.S.-Mexico War and, uh, and also as well as the Gadsden Purchase of 1853. Arizona is the last state within the continental 48 states to enter the Union. Um, as you recall, it entered the Union in basically 98 years ago in, in 1912. Uh, along with New Mexico. They were the last two of the states to enter the Union because uh, numerically Hispanics were the majority of, of those two states, uh, specifically more on, on, on the New Mexico side. But on, on Arizona, as we have uh, learned to appreciate, the Southwest has been a region of the country which has experienced a tremendous population growth, economic boom uh, over the past uh, 30, 40 years. And it's really interesting to observe that in, in 1980, the population size of Arizona was at 2.6 million. And today it's at roughly 6.7 million. So you have roughly 4 million people in the last uh, 30, th uh, 30 years to have either were born or migrated or moved to Arizona as a result of economic opportunities. But uh, as Americans, we need to uh, consider the following. There the Arizona, like New Mexico or even Texas, well, in the Southwest, for that matter, has had traditionally three, if you will, major cultures. There is the Native American culture, which is uh, that's a part of the region where th we have still to this day the largest population of Native Americans. The Navajo uh, people are, 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 tr are there in that part of the region. The Hispanic presence, which has, again, we're talking about three, four hundred years of, of continued presence in history. And, of course, the, you know, the, the American presence as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, since this growth of four million people, uh, the question we have to ask ourselves, where has this growth come from? And you know, people tend to think, oh, it's come from immigration from Mexico because of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, immigrants looking, seeking for a better life. But no, it's also come from Americans seeking a better life, moving to a state that has, has had this amazing economic growth and opportunities for other Americans. And it's interesting to observe also that today's elected officials in the state of Arizona, whether it's your governor of Arizona, your two senators, uh, three of the eight members of Congress representing Arizona, and as well as a majority of the state senators from Arizona who voted for uh, this bill, the SB 1070 as it's called, they're not native Arizonans. They all migrated or immigrated, if you will, from other parts of the country as a result of, of economic opportunities. So what you're seeing is 
as the United States itself is the most transient society in the world. You know, we live in many parts of the country throughout our professional careers. Um, and it's interesting to observe how uh, there are, you know, in, uh, individuals who are running for public office or elected officials, uh, such as the case of uh, J.D. Hayworth, who's running against Senator John McCain. Uh, con former Congressman J.D. Hayworth is from the state of Nebraska, who moved to Arizona in, in 1987 to work as a sportscaster and now is running for office. So it's important to appreciate this type of uh, demographic uh, or migration patterns that are taking place internally in the United States to get a better sense of an appreciation of what is happening in a state like Arizona today. I, I think it's important mm -hmm. as well though, Octavia, if you could talk a little bit about political participation. Mm -hmm because it varies tremendously. It does. If you were to look at the case of the uh, Cuban community mm -hmm. in Miami, uh, that the Cuban American community is incredibly uh, organized, mm -hmm. politically savvy, uh, and has accumulated in a short amount of time, relatively speaking, um, uh, a tremendous amount of power. And yet, if you look at the case of Arizona, even though, as you pointed mm -hmm. out, there's a good three to 400 years of uh, history there, um, unlike, say, the case of New Mexico, Texas, and California to a certain degree, um, Hispanics in Arizona have uh, relatively little power because they are not registered mm -hmm. in large numbers to vote and they're not represented as well in large numbers mm -hmm. um, in the state legislature and in other um, uh, political office. And so, as somebody who works for mm -hmm. Chile, mm -hmm. <laughs> the Congressional Hispanic mm -hmm. Leadership Institute, tell us from your leadership position, what are some of the initiatives that are happening to counteract, if not today, uh, you know, lay down the foundation for, I guess, um, more political representation uh, sure. in the future. Sure, sure. Now, the, um, here in the United States, as we can all well appreciate, in order to vote, you have to register to vote which is a major, uh, I guess, challenge in, in many aspects because, you know, as a society itself, we don't have very, we, don't, we can't really pride ourselves in, in a high participation rate when it comes to participating in, in, in elections, whether it's local or, or national. Uh, having said that, the challenges within the Hispanic community on the v v voting pro uh, participation is influenced by three factors. One is that uh, basically a third of the population is under the age of 18. Uh, the last figure I, I saw was 34% of the, of the Hispanic population is less than the age of 18 compared to 22% of the general population. The second factor is uh, another third of the population is, are not U.S. citizens yet. Either they're obviously legal immigrants or permanent residents or, or obviously they're here uh, undocumented. And the, then you have the, the, the remaining third who are U.S. citizens above the age of 18. Now that specific group, uh, the potential voting size for the Hispanic community, if I'm not mistaken, is roughly around 20 million. We have between yeah, the 18, 20 million. But yet in this last election, <coughs> only 10 million of these 20 million actually registered and voted in the 2008 presidential election. So you have roughly 50% participation rate within those eligible U.S. citizens who are of Hispanic descent. When you look at states like a state like Arizona, that 50% that I'm talking to who, who participated and voted, that number goes down to 12%. So in other words, there is a large disparity even within st uh, at the state to state level. Um, that again, that has to, can be explained again that a uh, large number of the uh, Hispanic population in Arizona is still under the age of 18. And also you have a good number that are not U.S. citizens and registered to vote in, in the state of Arizona. So again, that's a challenge that uh, many national Hispanic organizations that are of uh, well-known are focusing on, and that is, you know, getting uh, people to register and vote and participate to to be a part of the of the American uh, democracy experience, a uh, democratic experience. And um, again, that's something that over time will improve. And it and, and the, again, I go back that the U.S. Hispanic community again is the only demographic group that is actually growing at uh, every year when it comes to to elections. Uh, and I'm sure beginning 2012 you will see a considerable jump in participation, especially in those states where as a result of the 2010 census, they're going to increase their congressional representation. For example, the state of Texas is estimated for the first time since I believe it en entered the union will grow by a number of, its congressional representation will grow by a number, by four. Uh, in Arizona, by That's two. Extraordinary. Florida, by two. South Carolina, by one. Georgia, by one. And then you have states like uh, California that for the first time in its history 
is not going to have an additional congressional seat added to the state because of a net migration that's taking place of people moving from California to states like Arizona or other parts of the country. And yet, other states that are losing population, that are losing uh, pol uh, electoral votes, if you will, when it comes down to the, the presidential elections, are states like New York, Ohio, which is traditionally has been a swing state. How many, over the last two elections, Ohio has been a battleground for the presidential elections. Ohio's going to lose a congressional uh, district. Illinois is losing another one. Pennsylvania is losing another one. Why? Because part of this population is moving towards the west, towards the southwest. And that's and something that's very fascinating to, to observe. And I, I, what's, mm -hmm. what's fascinating about that, of course, is that um, as that shift continues, because it started from mm -hmm. uh, the Midwest and from mm -hmm. the Northeast uh, to the South and to the West, um, all of a sudden the Hispanic population really comes into play politically and we saw that in the 2008 election mm -hmm. and even to a certain degree we saw that in the 2000 election with these incredible gains that George W. Bush made mm -hmm. with the uh, Hispanic uh, uh, voting uh, mm -hmm. population and which President Obama was able to pretty much erase and gain back. Um, but one thing that's really interesting for me I think mm -hmm. is um, because of these politics that are not just about immigration, um, but as you mentioned, have to do with uh, electoral power, um, and that's important because that determines your your number mm -hmm. of seats um, in Congress. Determine uh, if you know what kind of money your community is going to get for infrastructure, for roads, for schools, mm -hmm. for police stations, and yet what you have is this time, I think, where politically you're just kind of doing like this because you have a very vociferous group um, uh, that has been, um, that has engaged in some nativist mm -hmm. uh, uh, and inflammatory rhetoric and at the same time uh, we have, for example, a group of Christian evangelical uh, ministers who are traditionally Republican and who have said, you know what, we need to think about the future. Mm -hmm. Firstly, we need to do the right thing because that's what our faith asks us to do. But we also need to think about the future and therefore we're going to embrace our um, Hispanic brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about th that movement that's going on and what kind of, I guess, um, bellwether that is or is not sure. for where um, the politics of this debate is going. Sure, sure absolutely. The, um, the, the Hispanic community is, in all practical purpose, a, you know, is, is, is a pillar of, if you will, of our nation's West identity as a Western society. Uh, Spain, through its uh, exploration of, of the Americas and having brought forth the first, uh, if you will, settlements in, in what it is now the United States, uh, basically introduced Western civilization, the Catholic faith, to this part of the world. Uh, and because of our m identity primarily as Catholics, in the, today Americans of Hispanic descent are approximately 70% are very, are de identify themselves in our Catholics, whereas 15% are part of the evangelical Christian movement and the growing part of that, of that uh, f community, faith community. Uh, the, the focus is the interest is on behalf of the evangelical Christians is that's where they see the growth in their respective uh, uh, faiths or de de denominations. The Hispanic community is, you know, with, with all due respect to others who may differ with me on this one, is traditionally conservative. It's a very pro-family, pro-life, uh, you know, family-focused community, which, again, I go back to my earlier comment that it resembles the, the United States of the 1950s. And uh, we live in, in, fa in a family structure that is multi-generational, whereas if our, our, our parents or our grandparents who are ailing and, and, and living their last years of life, we'll prefer to have them in our house rather than sending them to a, a, a nursing home to live out their last days, whereas we you know, welcome and cherish our children with open arms, whether they were you know, born in, you know, out of wedlock or not. And it's a, it's a community that obviously uh, you know, serves a, serves a strong testament that, you know, the basic family structure of, the, of any, the basic, you know, the strength of any society is its family structure. So, again, the, the, the current interest on part of the inv Christian evangelical uh, community is that it is important to reach out 
and engage the Hispanic community because that is where they see their future. Recall from the 1980s and 1990s the Christian Coalition, which basically rode the wave of, of the Reagan conservative movement of the 1980s and into the 1990s. And you ask yourself, where is the Christian Coalition today? Perhaps it's still registered as name known yet. I haven't checked, I haven't heard of any of them being active, especially on the, on the political end. But it's important to note that uh, you know, it is, you know, the United States scene, it's very interesting how, you know, we are the most secular uh, country in, in many ways, but yet we're also the most religious. And if you look at Europe, how Europe is often criticized or commented that it's living a post-Christian era, well yet here in the United States we have, you know, still have one Catholic church, we have about a dozen or so Orthodox churches, and yet over 6,000 Christian do registered do denominations, you know? So it's kind of interesting to see that um, that this particular group, which traditionally aligns itself with uh, the conservative movement, the Republican Party, is actually uh, bringing attention to this part, part of our uh, uh, political uh, conversation, the importance of reaching out and, and considering you know, uh, uh, immigration reform as, as a positive for the country. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, we, we've talked about family and about community uh, and about um, certainly the, you know, role of uh, mm -hmm. some faith-based communities um, in the role of the immigration debate, but I want to bring it back to the federal um, mm -hmm. level and to SB 1070, the Arizona law that is the hot topic, uh, one of the hot topics today. And that, uh, I had mentioned that I was a reporter mm -hmm. on a local reporter at the, um, on the U.S.-Mexico border in Brownsville um, mm -hmm. uh, a long time ago. And at the time, uh, there were a hundred thousand uh, people officially living in the city of Brownsville, and Brownsville Independent School District, which is the name of the um, of the public school system, had fifty thousand students. Go figure. Uh, and so, what I've mm -hmm. seen as a journalist on the U.S.-Mexico border is really the um, extreme burden that communities, municipalities, and states have had to burden um, because the federal government has not acted um, to move towards some kind of uh, immigration mm -hmm. reform that would um, ultimately enfranchise a large group of people that are living in this country undocumented mm -hmm. and illegally. And so, what, so that's one way, in my view, to read SB 1070 is one state or community saying, okay, the, 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 the nonsense in Washington is mm -hmm. going to continue, so we need to, we need to do something. Of course, there's other ways to read that, sure. um, the reelection of the governor and, uh, and so forth. But from my experience as a journalist, um, there are states and there are emergency <coughs> rooms, there are school districts, there are police departments that are overburdened, jail cells that are just popping mm -hmm. because they are left to, with very little funds from Washington, to uh, deal with this big group of people that's living in their um, communities. Mm -hmm. So Octavio, provided that you have a crystal ball that you can look into and uh, mm -hmm. tell us what the future is going to be like, d d how much uglier do you think it's going to get before we actually move towards some kind of immigration reform, or do you think it's out of reach? It, do you believe that President Obama is going to deliver on the promise that he made to Latinos? That's that there would be immigration <laughs> reform? It wasn't, uh -huh. his, it wasn't in the first year. Uh -huh. Do you think it's going to be in this term? I, I, I find it very difficult to, for it to be the first term. I, it, it's just, again, that's a very <laughs> direct question, a very uh, difficult question, which I'll try to answer it in the most diplomatic manner possible, but yet I'll obviously be very, uh, you know, try to answer your question as, as a good The, um, again, this, we're, we're at, a, uh, at a crossing point on, on this particular show, on the immigration issue. You know, we, as Americans in the United States, we see immigration as a domestic policy issue, whereas the whole world is experiencing immigration challenges. And we need to pause you know, take a chill pill, if you will, and, you know, really, you know, in, you know, take a lot of factors into consideration. There, 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 are, there are economic arguments for 
a comprehensive immigration uh, reform plan. There are, uh, you know, perhaps a moral value, but there's also concerns and legitimate concerns on national sovereignty, national security, as well as the, the, the right of any sovereign nation to defend or to allow or to control its, its borders, no? We, we also have to pause and appreciate that as, uh, as immigrants or, you know, or immigrants in the waiting must always acknowledge and appreciate that it is a privilege to immigrate to a country like the United States. It's not a right. And we do have approximately 11 million individuals who have, if you will, the first act in, on U.S. soil was to violate a law of the country. That is, entering the country illegally or undocumented. Uh, again, we need to, um, you know, just address this issue with, with courage, with respect, and obviously have a, a conversation that is, is, is realistic. Uh, there, there's, it's unrealistic to say that first we need to secure the border and then have a, uh, and then we could deal with the backlog on the immigration issue. The, the U.S.-Mexico border is very dynamic. It is, you know, there's a lot of economic trade that takes place. There, there are families, ties on both sides of the border. Uh, and it's important that when we have public officials calling out or saying, you know, let's secure the border first, my question to them is, how many times have you been to the border yourself? I mean, do you understand the, the nuances, the complexities, the, the dynamics that takes place in a, in a region of our country that is very, uh, you know, much, you know, it's rich in its, uh, its economic activity, but also in, in its, uh, in its you know, in the, in the people, people exchange, no? The, it, it is, you know, currently the U.S. has experienced a very difficult economic time. And of course, during traditionally, historically, when our country or any uh, country goes through an economic downturn, there is uh, a rise in rhetoric against individuals who are perhaps from other parts who came as immigrants. And it's important to know that the Hispanic community in general is a very entrepreneurial com community. And if given the opportunity, they will contribute economically to the, the growth of this country. And the best example I could give is the 1986 uh, immigration Reform Act that uh, allowed uh, approximately three million undocumented uh, immigrants at that point in time to become legal permanent residents. And if you track those three million who, as a result of, this of the 1986 bill, uh, where they are today economically, they're much better off. They're they're contributing to the to to state uh, uh, you know revenue in terms of ta taxes, whether it's income or or sales tax. The children are obtaining education levels that are enviable. And uh, again, it's just a question of time allowing, giving an individual the opportunity to, if you will, contribute to society. How we deal with individuals who have violated a, a, the law, in this case, entering the U.S. undocumented, that is something that we, obviously we need to all come into an agreement. Um, you know, paying a hefty fee, a hefty penalty, may be or may not be a, hef a, 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 a price to pay, but, or, but it is important to also acknowledge and understand as Americans, why we're having this uh, immigration challenge. We have to understand the economics of Latin America as well, because that is where the source of, of most of U.S. immigration is coming from, uh, over at least over half of it at, at the present. You know, Latin America over the last 50 years, economically, politically, and socially, has been devastated by bad public policies. And uh, we can look at the historical pattern of migration that uh, up until a generation ago, Latin America was a destination for immigrants from Europe, from the Middle East, from Asia even, and now it's you know sending its mig its people are be are immigrating not only to the United States, Canada, but also to Europe, specifically Spain. Uh, so we have to look at this from a global perspective. There are positives to immigration, absolutely. The United States cannot grow, cannot maintain its uh, economic well-being or its economic competitiveness without immigration. Why? Because our population is not reproducing itself. Uh, and I go back to the demographic numbers. The, the only demographic group in the United States that is replacing itself is the Hispanic community. Everyone else is below that 2.1 threshold, 2.2 threshold that is the natural replacement rate that societies need to have. And you have to look at, at, at countries like Japan, like Russia, uh, Germany, even Spain, Italy, where the population growth is way below that 2.1. What is their future economically? Or politically, I mean, even at the global level, if their population is diminishing, result of it, you know, because of lower birth rates uh, and then also having an aging population, the United States is perhaps the only developed economic power that has a viable population to continue its economic growth, to continue its uh, economic well-being, 
as a result of of this uh, of, of immigration. And Octavio, if you'll mm -hmm. uh, allow me, I'd like to take the opportunity mm -hmm. right now to open it up to questions, uh, comments, thoughts. Um, who would like to start? Yes. And if uh, and there's a microphone right there. If you could identify yourself, please. My name is Todd Pickens. Unfortunately, I'm not bilingual. I'd like to be, and I think I still have time. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you about both of you. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend the Hispanic Caucus this last year, which was held at the Convention Center. Mm -hmm. And in the receiving line, I was uh, I spoke with and interviewed uh, Soledad O'Brien, who you, I'm sure you're familiar with, the mm -hmm. reporter. And one thing she said was uh, the new face of America was brown, reiterating the, the statistics that you quoted. I think it's very obvious that there will be a Hispanic president within the next, I think, within the next decade. Easily. You might be looking at him. No. <laughs> But also, what is that mm -hmm. the effect that it will have on African Americans, being that uh, traditionally there seems to have been a schism, if you will, between the mm -hmm. two groups, and you see that in penal institutions where you have Hispanic gangs and mm -hmm. African American gangs, and even in the, the, the barrios versus the ghettos. So as we rise up economically, will blacks and Hispanics become more closer, or we will, will we learn to speak Spanish, and, mm -hmm. and will we be able to prosper together? I'd like you to start, actually. You, start? Yeah. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Hispanic community is, is, as, is as diverse as the US Hispanic in general, right? The, 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 to identify yourself as Hispanic is not, if you will, a racial identity. It's a cultural identity. <coughs> and within the Hispanic community, what makes it so dynamic, so rich, so, um, I guess, ideal for opportunities such as this here at the Rumi Forum for intercultural and uh, religious dialogue is that we are a little bit a part of the world. I mean, again, you know, you know, there are, his, there are Hispanics who are white. You know, the vast majority of Hispanics are are white. You know, culturally, f you know, physically, if you will. Um, but also, we have uh, within our co communities, you know, Af the African element, the Asian element, the in and absolutely the indigenous element. And I think that allows us the opportunity to be, uh, you know, have strong ties or cultural ties with all different cultures or or, or groups of people. I, I, within the context of, of U.S. society, yes, I think there is a lot of opportunity and there's been a lot of work done by, by both African American community leaders and Hispanic leaders to better, you know, uh, find uh, com common, uh, you know, points where we can all work together. Um, and I think that's something that's been done over the, you know, if you will, the last 40 years. And you have to think how the Hispanic community basically patterned itself after the African American experience of the 50s and 60s with the civil rights movements. And if you look at all the national Hispanic organizations, they basically follow the pattern of activism or community uh, d leadership based on the role models that we have within the African American community. Uh, so there's that I experience right there. Uh, but it's also important to, as Americans, we all need to understand who we are collectively and, and individually. And it's important that we have that appreciation of knowing that, you know, what have, may have happened been the African American experience over the past 300 years, 400 years in U.S. history, um, in the challenges that we're facing within the Hispanic community, that there are opportunities where we can work together and, you know, and be able to confront issues such as what is taking place, you know, with the controversy of, of Arizona, whether it's, uh, you know, issues of, of voter uh, participation or or economic issues. But I've always seen, uh, you know, the African community as, you know, as fellow Americans who have done a great service to uh, all Americans in general because of, of individuals like Martin Luther King. And perhaps in this century, with our role as, you know, being the numbers that they are, that we have a responsibility to also, um, you know, you know take, pick up the flag and, and, and lead it so that we have this type of, you know, you know positive, I guess, you know, fraternal, you know, as, as Americans. Because that's, bottom line, that's where we are first of all, no? And then everything else comes after. Hmm? Do we have another question? Yes, Jenna. Uh, I don't want to go back, keep going back to the uh, topic, but uh, the, the topic of Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, and how that is impacting people's thought in the rest of the country. As you mentioned, maybe we're going to see some more of the same uh, policies coming out in different states. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with my mother uh, a few months back, uh, and 
She, um, I consider her pretty open-minded. She's a registered Democrat. Uh, you know, I didn't expect to hear what I heard coming from her, but she was talking about the justification of this um, policy because she had been hearing stories about, um, you know, outlaw people coming on to mm. the lands, um, cattle ranches, whatnot, uh, and basically, you know, having a battle uh, on these people's property and land. And how this story and these stories, I think, are being kind of used to propagate and to um, potentially, you know, influence the rest of the country and how they will make policy. So what is the Hispanic community uh, specifically uh, doing to, you know, public service announcements, uh, kind of, you know, bringing light to the situation? Um, like so many other topics in mm -hmm. the news that we hear from uh, sure. terrorism to, you know, health care, um, we get these little bits of information, unfortunately, in the media. Um, but that is the information that most of the country is getting. They're not getting the whole picture. Um, so what is the community doing in terms of responding to these sort of, because, I mean, she was making good arguments, my mother, but, you know, but I said, you know, this is not necessarily, though, the way to respond to these incidences mm -hmm. of outlawlessness. Sure. So uh, forth. I'd like to answer that one. <laughs> right. um, I, Jenna, you bring up such an important point, uh, which is about uh, the role that the media plays uh, in our society, uh, not just with immigration. Uh, if you were to look at news organizations uh, throughout uh, the country, uh, tel television uh, networks, uh, wire services, uh, the blogosphere, uh, as well as um, uh, our uh, newspapers uh, that are s that are left. Um, the higher up you go uh, in the uh, organization, the wider it gets. Now, what does that mean? Um, that means that the uh, the relevance of Th there's competition for news because you have a finite amount of space in a newspaper uh, and in the case of television uh, unless you're a cable outlet and they have a completely different dynamic uh, at a traditional uh, network like ABC News you have X amount of time your morning show is two hours and then you have to take away the weather segments and the, um, and, uh, the uh, commercials uh, your evening newscast is 22 minutes long because of commercials. And so you're competing for, uh, you're, you're competing to get into a rundown or to get into, or, or to get a byline. And if you're, if the people who are making the decisions have another view and they actually all kind of share the same view, then it's very likely, and it's just human nature, that topics that lie outside of that view may not get uh, represented. And so if you turn on um, Univision one night, you're going to see a very different story. They've been leading with immigration for I can't tell you how long. Um, they've been covering the drug war in Mexico on the U.S.-Mexico border for I can't tell you how long. And then every once in a while when something crazy and sensational happens, like the blowouts that have happened in Juarez or uh, SB 1070 in Arizona, then all of a sudden it's covered and, and, and it's not covered with depth and it's not covered, in my view, thoughtfully or with analysis. And so I think um, it, it, it forces um, people to have to, uh, I guess, be their own advocate and self-start and educate themselves because we don't have a mandate in the media um, because of the time that we're living in, because it's so fragmented, because of the competition, um, because, of the ch because of the changes in the culture where it's a shout fest, where everybody wants to be a reality mm -hmm. TV star. You don't have the mandate that you did in, in at another time to have a certain degree of public service. Um, I don't know if the civil rights battles of the 1960s and 70s uh, would have been covered the same way that they, that, 
that they were covered if it were happening today. I don't know because uh, the uh, because the uh, tensions at Kent State would probably be trumped by uh, Dancing with the Stars last night or American Idol, who got eliminated and who went on. Or Bachelor. Right. Or Bachelor. Right. So can I sure, respond to Ab what is the community? Absolutely, yeah. So we mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's, it's a, okay, here what we're dealing with is there is a conversation that is taking place, if you will, in our living rooms that is defined by why it's being seen on the cable news networks, you know, the Fidra Fox, your CNN, and then what is being seen on the Spanish language media, the Univision Telemundo. I see both media every day in both languages. <coughs> and it is, every day it's the same story. One, set, one, one, one view is saying this, and then the other is saying that, but there is not a, they're not on the same page. It is just amazing to see w a s the same story, how it's being played out. Whereas, and I'll, I'll give the example of I mean, Fox News if I can. Uh, you will see on Fox News, uh, if you, uh, perhaps, I don't say a, a one side of the story, but you will not s ever see the, the, the human immigrant side of the story as you will see it on Univision. And what you see on Univision, the stories that are being portrayed are gut-wrenching, heartbreaking. You know? and, the, and it's... And these are experiences that many Hispanic families are facing day to day. And I could you know, go from personal experiences of having members of my own family who, because of breaking a law, and obviously if they broke the law, they broke the law, and guess what, they're out, they're deported. And so you, obviously you, res you respect that. But you also know of cases where, you know, how of, of, of you know, US born children of undocumented parents and being separated. And that's something that, I don't know if we wanna go in, in that direction now, that, for example, this current administration, as I was seeing here in the news, ha is estimated that this year alone will be uh, deporting 400,000 undocumented immigrants out of the U.S. It, that's 400,000. That is basically equal the size of the undocumented population in the state of Arizona today, which is estimated 460,000. And already we're seeing about approximately 100,000 individuals as a result of this law leaving the state of Arizona. And, and uh, what's going to happen here is the economic impact of these of these hundred thousand people who every day go to the grocery stores, every day you know purchase items and contribute through sales tax or indirect taxes or perhaps even income taxes one way or the other? That's revenue that the state of Arizona is going to be losing. And again, I go back to my example of the, of the state of Kansas because that's where I um, am more familiar with. You know, on the economic side, you know, the state of Kansas, like many states, are facing deficits, budget deficits. But if you take out a portion of the immigration of the population that is, if you will, of the uh, undocumented population, you will learn to exaggerate, exaggerate that uh, deficit even more. But going back to your point of view, yes, there are two conversations that are being held in the room, and no one's and no one's listening to each other. And for me, yeah. as an American who speaks both languages, who you know, I'm proud of my dual identity, if you will, it's very frustrating because I see one side of me saying this, and the other side is saying this, but no one is in agreement. And uh, and again, I guess it's all, all responsibility to, uh, with this issue in particular, pause, reflect, and educate yourself as best you can on all sides of the issue because it is a complex issue. And if I could just answer mm -hmm. your original question, Jenna, which was about how is the community reacting to this. Um, it's, it is reacting, although in my view as a journalist, it's reacting slowly. And so let me give you an example. For about a good two years or so, uh, since the president was elected and made the promise that he was going to, um, that there was going to be comprehensive immigration reform in his first year, um, uh, I've been covering it uh, at this manifestation of my life, although I've been covering this for at least 12 years, if not longer, if you refer back to my um, studies. And um, it was really interesting because at first, the different Latino um, uh, advocacy groups, civil rights organizations that I spoke with uh, were off the record furious that there was silence about uh, immigration. Um, but they did not want to cross the president and they wanted to say he is a man of his word. He will deliver. We will wait. And that's something that uh, U.S. Latinos have been hearing a lot. 
let us do financial reform, reform first, and then we'll get to immigration. Let us do climate change, and then we'll get to immigration. And I would say that about mm -hmm. March, perhaps, so probably at the end of last year, getting into the beginning of 2010, there was a big break. And um, the many leaders of Hispanic organizations uh, had very heated conversations at the White House and said, what's, what's going on? Are we going to have to go at this alone? And so what you're seeing is um, that the debate has, in my view, kind of run away, um, gotten out of the hands of the White House. As Jorge Ramos, the main anchor of Univision, told me when I interviewed him for a story that I wrote on, um, uh, uh, partly on immigration, he said, President Obama is v really th the worst and the best chance that uh, illegal immigrants have for comprehensive uh, reform. And I thought that that was a mm -hmm. very um, interesting thing for him to say. I think it'll be interesting to see how we go forward. Um, and just one last thing I'd like to say. Um, I have been amazed with certain groups, for example, certain conservative groups, how absolute rapid fire their reactions will be. I, my inbox explodes with when something breaks that's not to their liking. Rapid fire response, my inbox explodes. Um, if something that is uh, viewed as inflammatory uh, or slams U.S. Hispanics uh, airs or uh, happens, it will take sometimes 24 hours for uh, some of these uh, civil rights groups to, react. to mm -hmm. react and to get a press release. Um, and that's a problem. I would say that um, there is a page to be taken from the Karl Rove and the Ed Gillespie book of how you react to um, events, to shape an agenda. It's not reacting to agenda, it's shaping an agenda, in my personal view. Yes, a question right over here. Uh, Emre Chidik, uh, Rumi Forum. Uh, we've spoken about uh, mm -hmm. a federal issue at a state level, and uh, Arizona is the uh, issue at, uh, in the limelight. But are there states or regions that may be considered role models in regards to both minorities and uh, immigration issues? Mm -hmm. We've looked at something that is difficult, sticky. Sure. But are there states Absolutely. and mm -hmm. regions that you may be able to point out and what makes them mm -hmm. uh, role models or samples? Absolutely. Uh, from, from my view, I would say Florida, Texas, and New Mexico, in, from the Hispanic experience. And why? Florida, uh, Miami, the South South Florida community uh, has, you know, for the past 50 years been strongly influenced by, you know, by Cuban, Cuban immigration from, as a result of, of, of uh, the Castros, no? In, in my personal opinion, I would say, and put this to everyone's consideration, if you look at the most successful immigrant group in our entire national history, I would say it's Cuban Americans. Because within two generations, they have been able to transform South Florida to become a dynamic economic hub, not only for the U.S., but also for the entire Americas. They have transformed the, you know, the political scene in, in, in the state of Florida. You have right now four members of Congress who are of Cuban descent. We had, until recently, two, two U.S. senators who are of Cuban descent. For that to happen within two generations is, is obviously e extraordinary. Um, the another example would be the state of Texas, where uh, you know, the, the identity, the Hispanic identity is very much part of the state um, as a result of th the history of Texas, no? And it is, uh, there are parts of the state of Texas, like San Antonio, I would say that, that the, bus the Hispanic business community is very much engaged uh, with the, the development of South Texas, uh, looking at opportunities outside of the U.S., in this case looking at, you know, taking advantage of the historical links that San Antonio has with Spain, for example, and New Mexico would be the other one. Um, for me, New Mexico is perhaps my favorite state of the, of, the, of the union because of the dynamic, you know, uh, blending of the, of the three major cultures, you know, the Native American culture, the Hispanic culture, and of course, the uh, Anglo-American culture. Um, there are other, uh, perhaps, you know, best case 
or examples of local communities that obviously have done well. I've always prided myself, you know, being from Kansas because, uh, you know, you know, we were commenting earlier how growing up, I've never felt myself different than from my peers going to school. The only difference for me was that at home I spoke Spanish. And so I always grew up with this identity as an American who was the son of immigrants from Mexico who did not feel himself differently either racially or perhaps even religiously because as a Catholic, you know, being part of a you know, Christian society here, but also, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's just something that, I guess it, it depends on your world, you know, how, how you're raised influences your worldview, of course, no? And uh, again, I've always prided, uh, been grateful for the opportunities I've had growing up in, in the state of Kansas. Today, it's a different story. Uh, and I'm, I'm concerned, for example, that the author of these state laws, the Arizona uh, SB 1070 and so forth, is, uh, is, a, is an individual who's running for Secretary of State of Kansas, and his uh, main point in this uh, election uh, is to prevent uh, undocumented immigrants from voting. And if you ask yourself, well, what's the percentage of undocumented immigrants that actually register and vote, I would have to argue, show me the numbers and I'll show you that you're absolutely, you have nothing to, you know, it's all, uh, I don't know, all hype. Yeah, it's I, illegal to do of that. Of course, it's, <laughs> it's totally illegal. <laughs> and not only that, I am more concerned with uh, so individuals. You see that, so you see that as hype and um, hype. inflammatory without, type without uh, doubt. tactics mm -hmm. to rouse up some Absolutely. attention. And, 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 he, and I go back to, again, uh, to a former boss of mine who was a member of Congress who was running for Senate in the state of Kansas, and I vividly remember him telling me the day I started his office, you know, being from, his, uh, from the congressional district, you know, you know, in, in Hispanics in, in, in my, in my district, in congressional district, whether they're legal or un illegal, they're my constituents. I don't care if, what their status is. I'm here to serve. But now, in this tight Senate race, they've gone to accusing each other as flip-flops on, on the immigration issue. And again, they're trying to reach a, a particular demographic of the population that is obviously very engaged politically and in terms of, of, of their per, per, uh, vote participation rate. Um, which gives them those extra bonus points, right? But at what cost? Yes, at short term you may gain, but the long term you're going to lose uh, tremendously, which is my concern on behalf, uh, with, uh, from looking at the, the Republican Party long term, if Arizona, as a result of this, of this issue, Arizona could go, if you will, blue, right? When you go to Democrats, blue. Uh, again, Arizona has in, uh, it has voted re for re a Republican candidate and also for a Democratic presidential candidate in the last 20, 20 or so years. I believe in 1986 it voted for Clinton, then 2000, 2004 it went for, uh, for the Republican candidate and as well as in 2008 with McCain being from, from the state. So yes, so this has a tremendous uh, impl implications at the national level um, because both parties need to remain competitive within the Hispanic community because it is the swing group demographically. Um, and in order to get to the White House, it's already been proven you have to win those states with the highest uh, electoral votes. And what are those states with the highest electoral votes? There are the states where 80% of the Hispanic population are located. It's your New Yorks, your New Jerseys, your Florida, your Texas, Arizona, and California. So. And I'm just going to briefly mm -hmm. answer in a very Pollyanna way, I think. Um, mm -hmm. When you asked about uh, if there's a state or a city or a community, um, and I say it's the United States. And the reason I say that is because I am before you as the daughter of uh, immigrants uh, uh, and the daughter, uh, the proud daughter of a retired machinist who came to this country and who ended up uh, through uh, hard work of my parents and faith that my parents had in me. Um, mm -hmm. They placed their dreams in me and, and, and in my brother and my sister and all of us. Um, are, c I hope, contributing sure. uh, to our uh, communities and to our mm -hmm. state and to our nation and to our world. And I have to say that, you know, whatever has happened since the election um, uh, and the dreams that were deposited in President Obama uh, and the reality of governing, which is so different than campaigning. I remember when I was 14 years old and I came to Washington on my first close-up trip, which was basically a civics class field trip to Washington. And I remember listening to Schoolhouse Rock, you know, when a bill becomes a law. And then I came to Washington four years ago and have worked in Washington, covering Washington. And politics is dirty. 
democracy is messy. And the fact that this country was able to elect an African-American president named Barack Obama is extraordinary. Whatever happens, whatever happens since the election, whatever happens afterwards, I don't think this would have happened in any other um, part of the world, is my opinion. <laughs> it's a very interesting conversation. My name is uh, Rafael Behat. I'm an adjunct professor at uh, GSPM, the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University. And I've been a long time political uh, uh, activist, uh, not only in the United States, but also um, promoting democracy abroad. Um, and my question to both of you mm -hmm. is uh, with uh, the do you see the Hispanic community suffering from a sort of political identity crisis, given the fact that there's been basically uh, pandering and false promises from um, uh, liberal Democrats and insensitive remarks, historic insensitive remarks mm -hmm. from uh, conservative Republicans? Good question. That's a very good question. Very good question. Um, we you know we, we look at the numbers and and you know I, I guess you and I are perhaps more familiar with those numbers in terms of the uh, voting preferences with 